Don't go down that way. Or that way, for that matter. Barbed wire strung across trunks of trees stretches along the forest. It's impossible to cross. Unless you know where to look, that is. You know, a couple of months ago, I wouldn't have had a clue about the forest. Oh, yes, I had my training. The Central Women's Sniper School taught me well. But you can't beat local knowledge. And that's what Vartanov gave me. It wasn't that far from here I first met him. Out of nowhere, this white-haired old man in a grey civilian jacket with a knapsack on his shoulders emerged from a thicket of thick bushes. He looked like some sort of wood spirit with his thin stooped figure and a great shaggy beard. I almost shot him in my surprise. He threw both hands up in the air and shouted, friend, friend, thrusting his Soviet passport at me. Lowering my rifle, I asked him, who was he? And what was he doing on our front line? But more importantly, how had he got past the German lookout tower further down the track? He explained that he'd lived his entire life in this forest and knew paths and tracks no one else would know about. At least not anymore. And then he wept. The tears rolled down his white beard and began to fall onto his jacket. Then he told me his story and it was all too familiar. A group of Nazi soldiers had turned up at his farm one cold morning. He wasn't there, he was at the local market trading furs. And when he returned, the Nazis had set up a sort of German staff headquarters in his home. He waited by the tree line and watched. He didn't dare go any nearer. And then a thought struck him like lightning. What had happened to his wife and son? He waited hours, desperate to get a glimpse of them. And then he heard laughter coming from the back of his property. So he crept along to see more. He told me he almost gave himself away when he saw his wife tied to a tree shot dead. Blood dripped from her head onto her chest, her head lolled. And then he noticed his son kneeling in the dirt, weeping. A Nazi officer strode over to the boy, took out his sidearm and shot the boy as well. The old man ran back into the woods, terrified his grief would give him away. He told me he decided to go back the next day. He watched his house. They'd started to move things there. They had, uh, they'd moved a, a caterpillar armored transport. It had many aerials and a machine gun on the roof of the cab. A tractor cannon type thing, cars, motorbikes, troops dressed in grey green uniforms, troops dressed in black jackets. And the officer. The old man watched him especially. He was a big blonde man, aged about 40, with steely blue eyes. He'd seen him in a parade uniform with braided silver epaulets. And he was now living in his son's room. After a few days watching him, the old hunter made up his mind. He came to find us. He wanted our help to avenge his family. I took him back to headquarters. And on the way, he told me that his name was Nikolai Vartanov. When he'd heard the story, the comrade commander gave me three men and five days to do the job. Vartanov begged to be one of the men. I could see that my commander wasn't impressed, but I managed to persuade him of the benefits of Vartanov's knowledge. I think giving him my recently acquired Luger might have helped. I spent the next days with Vartanov. I followed the old hunter along barely detectable paths. He taught me how to judge distance through the trees. He helped me to read the forest to know this plant grows in and around ditches, this only on the east face of a tree. He showed me secret paths and tracks. We spent four days observing the Nazis in Vartanov's house. I noted down all their comings and goings. I noted the wind at different times of the day, how as the hours passed, the weather changed. See, snipers say the rifle fires the bullet. 
but it's the wind that carries it. And it's true. Then I searched for the best places to position my team. See, if I chose this spot, the wind would be blowing at 90 degrees. So at 100 meters, I would have to consider my angle for shooting. It could cause a bullet to drift significantly. And all this I did while the old man sat quietly at my side. And on the fifth day, I was ready to begin the hunt. I decided to take Fyodor, a young lad recently promoted to junior sergeant, and a Siberian called Pyotr. He was an excellent shot, and both were quiet and followed orders. Two things my mission needed. I thought heavily about what equipment we would need. I took my faithful mods in. The soldiers took the papashas. It was what they were used to. Vartanov didn't have any weapons. I managed to bag an old rifle from stores for him to take. And I took a supply of 200 cartridges and five grenades each. I stuck my pistol in my pack thinking, if it comes to grenades and pistols, something would have gone badly wrong. At first light, we set off for the farm and in accordance with the plan, took up positions around the Nazi's rear. I was with the old hunter. We crawled into a clearing disguised under a, a large shrub the two soldiers split up, one to my right, the other to the left, and between us, we covered the whole property. The wind rose slightly. It blew in gusts about eight to nine meters per second. I worked out its direction. I, I picked up a small pile of dirt and I watched which way it fell. I calculated the necessary correction for the dial on the lateral drum of the tube of my telescopic sight. Right on time, at 11.50, the kitchen rolled up, mess tins out. I waited until they'd all crowded round. I scanned the gathered men. I settled my sights on a lanky junior officer. He stood out, he was talking very loudly. He stood up and through my sights, I followed him as he made his way over to the cook. His head, with his cloth cap, ended up exactly between the three lines in the eyepiece of my sights. I took a long, deep breath. Slowly, I started to exhale. And at the same time, I started to apply pressure to the trigger. I squeezed lightly. I didn't see what would happen. I pulled the bolt and took a second shot and that Fyodor and Piotr started to fire. We unleashed a hail of fire from three points. The bullets, flew into the grey-green crowd. It made mincemeat of them. The fascists didn't have their weapons, so they couldn't even respond. When they heard the shots, well, more soldiers came running out of the house. And my bullets hit the first three in succession. The first between the eyes, and the second in the throat, and the third on the right side of his head. My preparation was paying off. The old hunter next to me was also firing. He felt a soldier charging over to our position with a pistol in his hand. Vatanov moved as if to get up. No, I hissed. Wait. When I pulled him back down, you see, a sniper never reveals their position. A sniper never leaves cover for open ground. We waited. The seconds ticked by. Silence fell around the farm. And then I saw movement. The back door slowly pushed open. I could only just make out a shape in the gloom. I lifted my rifle, and Vartanov whispered, No, let me. So I lowered my rifle. He shuffled slightly, raised his gun, cocked the bolt, and shot. The figure in the doorway fell out of the gloom and into the afternoon light. It was the blonde officer. Piotr and Fyodor rushed into the farmhouse through the building and signaled it was all clear. I closed my eyes for a second. <laughs> oh, opened them. And there was something different about the forest in that moment. The wind died down, the air cooled. I stood and walked slowly over to the officer, Vartanov at my side, and I glanced over at the old hunter. Tears were streaming down his face. He stood there, silently weeping. 
I stopped and stood in front of him. I, I reached out and took his hand. And a shot <laughs> rang out of the silence. The old man's head jerked back in front of me. I whirled around, shooting my handgun as I turned. A fascist officer fell back with smoking pistol still in his hand. I continued firing until the gun was just clicking, empty, and still I fired. Stupid. 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 A sniper knows never to take their eyes off the enemy until you know for sure that the enemy is dead. When I first went to war, I felt only anger at the Germans for disrupting my peaceful life, for invading our country and attacking us. But what I saw in war engendered in me such an inextinguishable hatred that was difficult to express in any other terms than a bullet through a Nazi's heart. Hatred teaches you a lot. Hatred has sharpened my vision and hearing. Hatred has made me wily and dexterous. Hatred taught me to camouflage myself, to deceive the enemy, to anticipate his cunning. Hatred has taught me to kill. I am a sniper. At Odessa, then the forests, and now onwards towards Sevastopol. So far, I have killed dozens of fascists, some confirmed officially, some in my own tally, all with my rifle, my gun. And as long as there is a single invader in our land, I will only think of one thing, killing the enemy. I survive for those that haven't. By repeating their names over and over again, I somehow restore them from oblivion. Pyotr, the Siberian killed on the way to Sevastopol. Fyodor, killed the next week in a skirmish. And Vartanov, killed by the fascist that killed his wife and child. I am a sniper.